are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 80. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be meeting Mike Omer, who is the author of the best-selling Zoe Bentley and Glenmore Park mystery series. In the past, Mike's been a journalist and a game developer, but he now writes heart-pounding, suspense-packed mystery thrillers, and he loves to write about the true the life people who are perpetrators or victims of crimes. His next book is In the Darkness, which will be published on June 25th, 2019. It's available now on pre-order. If you go to thrillingreads.com forward slash 80, you can uh, pick it up now and it'll be available when it's published. It's the second book in the Zoe Bentley mystery series. And it's again following a forensic psychologist, Zoe Bentley, as she fights a mental war against two serial killers. I highly recommend that you check out the first book in that series, A Killer's Mind, uh, which just blew me away. So we're going to be talking with Mike about his uh, writing process and, of course, a whole bunch more. So stay tuned for episode number 80. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Alan with Meet the Thriller Author. And on the phone here, I have Michael Omer. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. And uh, for our listeners who might not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I live in Israel. I'm married with three kids. So that's my family life. I also have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I started uh, publishing as my Homer mysteries and thrillers about, I think the first one was on 2015. If I'm not mistaken, the end of 2015, I published three mystery books called the Glenmore Park Mysteries. And then I published a thriller called uh, A Killer's Mind. It's like a, a crime thriller published by Thomas and Mercer. And that's it. Uh, a Killer's Mind was quite successful. It became a Washington Post bestseller. And uh, recently the audiobook was a New York Times bestseller. So that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is, a, it is a fantastic book. I read it, and that's when I, when I finished reading it, I'm like, oh, I, I want to get you on the podcast. It was, a, it was a very good book. A lot of uh, mystery and a lot of creepy stuff. <laughs> I'm happy with the way it came out. Yeah, and then your next book, you're going to continue the Zoe Bentley series? Yeah, yeah. The next book, In the Darkness, it's out this summer, and it's basically uh, the sequel to A Killer's Mind. It continues one month after... The first book. Hmm. And so how did that, all this come about with, with Zoe Bentley and, and getting into the serial killer uh, storyline? How did you come up with that idea and how was that process? Well, basically, Zoe Bentley was a character that I initially didn't even want. Um, when I wrote what was eventually the first book in the Glenmore Park mystery books, Spider's Web, I wrote a book about a serial killer and I have a, a, an acquaintance who used to be the chief of police in Bangor, in Maine. And I asked him, would the FBI be involved in this? Because I knew, I knew a lot about like, how the police works, but I didn't know enough about the FBI. And he said, well, you can let the police do the actual investigation, but they'll probably involve the FBI and they'll probably get someone from the behavioral analysis unit to help them profile the killer. And <laughs> to be honest, I was like, oh no, <laughs> I just don't want to do that. <laughs> but then uh, I said, well, okay, whatever, I'll just insert her as like this really secondary character. She'll be in like one or two uh, like scenes. She'll be very annoying and then I'll remove her instantly. And then uh, what happened is I started writing her and I was like, hey, this is, actually, <laughs> this is actually working out pretty well. I like this character. And she turned out to be quite important in Spider's Web. She had an influential role there. And later, readers started asking for more books with her. So when I decided to write a new series, I, I figured out I might as well do some research and just focus on this character as a spin-off series from the Glenmore Park and it turned out to be much bigger than that in the end. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so it wasn't even supposed to be like a major character at first. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I literally had a moment where I was like, 
Should I give her a first name? <laughs> because she's just in this one scene and I, they'll probably call her by her last name. I was like debating with myself if she, if she should even have a first name. By then I said, yeah, okay, I'll give her a first name as well. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Now it's such a huge seller and that's such a popular character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So now when you start writing your books, do you do like a lot of outlining and, and planning before you start to write them? Yeah, it varies. So I used to outline about a week to 10 days. A killer's mind was outlined in a week, but it's like an outline. I go back and forth. I write an outline. And when I start writing, the outline falls apart <laughs> like 10 chapters or 15 chapters in. It falls apart completely. And I need to go back to the outline and start making adjustments and, and fix it and then go back to the book and I can go on for 10 more chapters and then it falls apart again. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an, a, an ongoing process. But last time I tried to, like, I'm writing book three right now and I uh, outlined for a month to see if the outline will hang on longer and it fell apart even faster so that was no good whatsoever so I think I basically I think I'm back to where I started where I outline about a week or 10 days and then I, I fix the outline as I go along uh, it's the only to, process that seems to work. For it, me. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It seems to be working pretty, uh, pretty well for you. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a frustrating process because whenever it falls apart, I can spend a day or two. Like it takes me like a day or two just to figure out that things aren't working anymore. That nothing is being written <laughs> just like write stuff and it doesn't work and I'm like what's what's going on here and then finally I'll be like oh yeah the outline isn't working again I'll have to fix that <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey, uh, I can imagine with uh, you probably have get your deadlines and all that uh, you start getting a little uh, <laughs> a little nervous yeah or... <laughs> it, it, it gets a bit tense at <laughs> Yeah. And then when you started writing, why did you choose uh, mysteries and thrillers? Were you a fan of those type of books beforehand? Well, I read all genres and literary fiction. I don't particularly read any specific genre. I actually, the first books I wrote were young adult horror books. They're still on Amazon, like they're sold under the name Michael Omer. They didn't sell so well at all. And then I figured I might as well try writing a mystery book because I like mysteries. I have like a few of my favorite books were mysteries. So I figured I can try that as a genre, see if that works better. So it wasn't my first choice, but it definitely clicked the best. Hmm. And uh, did you always want to be a writer from like when you were younger? Were you always trying? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah um, I published my first book in Israel back when I was 16. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I wrote like a fantasy, like a humor fantasy, very, very affected by Douglas Adams and uh, Terry Pratchett, like heavily affected by them. I wrote a book and I actually got a publisher here to publish it. It was a complete flop, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like my first step into the waters of being a writer. And then uh, I always thought about it as a hobby. There's this saying in Israel, which happens to be true, that you can't make money from writing in Israel. Like you can't actually make money as a writer because the market is really small. So you have to supplement it with all kinds of other things like writers often teach or they, or they work as journalists or things like that. So I always thought of being a writer as a hobby alongside whichever job I work at. But then when I entered the American literature market, I saw that making a living work like writing in English is actually something that you can do. Hmm. So I figured I might as well try it for a few years, see what happens. So your first book that you published when you were 16, it was uh, written in Hebrew? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. So, did, so the market there is small, but there is a, a market. Are they like the thriller books published in Israel in Hebrew and everything? And yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. The, my my books aren't. There's the Killer's Mind, like a bit ironically, is 
now translated into Hebrew. No. <laughs> like the English version is being translated into Hebrew. I am not actually involved. <laughs> uh, the publisher sold the rights to the publisher in Israel, and they aren't even engaging me to. See tell me how it's going on so I'm hoping it's fine <laughs> oh, that's too funny see that came full circle so you'll, yeah. have, so you'll have to look at it you'll be able to see if it, it was translated well <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, well, that's, uh, that's interesting and so um, were you obviously um, published through Amazon Thomas and Mercer oh no they don't do YA Thomas and Mercer right? no they don't do uh, the, the YA and my first mysteries were self-published oh, okay. they were like yeah I published mm-hmm. them and then Thomas and Mercer started after I published my three mysteries. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So, you learned a lot from that process of doing it all on your own and the marketing yeah. and all, all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an amazing adventure. I actually really enjoyed this uh, process. Like, it was so exciting and such a, an exciting new world. Um, learning to do all that stuff, which is, like, not something I ever considered doing learning to advertise, to, to choose my own, to brand my own cover, to like, it was, it was really, really exciting. And I met a lot of amazing people in the process. Mm-hmm. So, so it was a lot of fun. It was definitely worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially nowadays, even, even though when you're, if you have a publisher, they still expect you to do a lot of marketing yourself and social media and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, amusingly enough, Thomas and Mercer, don't expect as much. No. Like they have a really strong marketing and like they don't expect the author to do the heavy lifting for them. They, they do a lot more than most publishers as, from what I've seen hmm. and they don't expect as much. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, everyone, um, the authors that I've interviewed that have been published with Thomas and Mercer, they all have very good things to say. So they must be really on the on the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I have a few like a few acquaintances in Thomas and Mercer, and everyone are really pleased with how they work. Hmm. Uh, they're really great to work with. So how is it that you come with your ideas then for these stories, especially like the serial killers and everything? Do you read an article and then it starts getting in your head or? <laughs> It varies. I just heard uh, Neil Gaiman now has a master class um, he, where he teaches writing, and I saw some of it. It's really good. And he said that when you ask writers where they get their ideas, they'll say something like, from the idea store. <laughs> <laughs> or or they'll, they'll be like assholes. <laughs> they'll try to, do, to make it, uh, like, make a joke out of it. And he said, and I really, really loved it because it was so true. He said, the truth is that we're assholes because we're terrified because we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but then he says some other stuff that I really connected with. And I think sometimes it's something that you read or like two ideas connecting together in your mind, like two very different ideas connecting together to create some sort of something new, something that hasn't been done before. That's pretty much what happened to me with the A Killer's Mind, where I got the idea after reading the biography of um, Ed Kemper, I think. Oh, Ed Kemp- Edmund Kemper, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. He wasn't too far from where I live, where he was doing that stuff. Oh. <laughs> By Santa Cruz. No, no, hang on. No, it wasn't Ed Kemper. It was someone else. Um, but he, he was like one of the more horrific serial killers and I'll, I'll remember his name by the end of the interview <laughs> oh yeah it was Dahmer oh yeah Jeffrey Dahmer Jeffrey Dahmer yeah mm-hmm. so Jeffrey Dahmer um, I read his biography and it got me thinking he had this is a like I can go a bit graphic here right We're, oh yeah yeah no problem <laughs> <laughs> like he had a whole like he would keep the bodies after he'd kill the victims and he would do stuff with them and and I figured that I could take it like a step further but also make it a bit more emotional like find a really different reason to why he's doing it and I figured that it could be his like twisted notion of love mm-hmm. The killer in a ki- oh I won't spoil uh, why he's doing it but like he has this history and this 
distorted idea of what a love is and what is the perfect relationship because of things that happened to him as a child and that influenced his entire psyche. So that all came from reading about Dahmer and then just trying to look at, try to find a different angle to, to his crimes, to like to find the reason for why he did what he did. So that's an, like an example of how, how I came to think of a killer's mind. But um, when I wrote Spider's Web, for instance, I just um, drove somewhere and it hit me and I ha have no idea like where the idea came. So sometimes it's just like things manifest. Sometimes <laughs> they come from something I read. It's really hard to pinpoint the exact process and um, which is a bit terrifying. Like I'm, I really am concerned that one day I'll be like, well, out of ideas, <laughs> <laughs> closing the shop now. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's funny. So even though you're very successful books, you still start to get paranoid that, that you're gonna run out of ideas. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I, it's like constant anxiety. <laughs> today, literally today, I had like an idea for my next series, um, and I was like telling my wife about it, and I was like, and I was I was like half sure I wouldn't be able to come up with like a good background for this character because. I'm all out. <laughs> and and it's, it's always such a relief to see that, yeah, no, it, it still works. Uh, like the idea, idea factory or whatever it is in my brain still is still working. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I really enjoyed about A Killer's Mind. Uh, like you said, uh, his methods were very unique. I mean, I read, I read a lot of these crime fictions and, you know, they're, all, they're good books, but, you know, sometimes it's kind of like the same way of doing things. But yours yeah. was very different with uh, what your killer was doing. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was actually pretty proud of it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah so people have to go check out that book and know what we're talking about <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything <laughs> this is this is the book where I, I actually have like the dedication in the in the book and I put it in the acknowledgments as well where um, I I was sitting uh, with my wife in a restaurant while we were like in a, our anniversary vacation and I was like she was talking about something like rational and I suddenly said if people were um, I, then I thought it would be taxidermy so I said if people were taxidermied uh, do you think they'd be flexible afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> and she like gave me this stare and she, uh, okay so we're talking about this now <laughs> it's a romantic <laughs> Yeah. Well, every writer's uh, browser search history is probably pretty frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, mine is terrible. <laughs> I'm constantly worried that like someone will knock on the door. Sorry, sir, we're from the government. You're going with us. You're coming with us. <laughs> yeah. The days of evil are done. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's good with the killer's mind too. So now, like, I'm a. Uh, uh, excited to see your next book to see what you came up with so I think that kind of sets the excitement going for your books yeah, <laughs> yeah and I see that it's going to focus that there's always going to be dealing with two serial killers in the next book so yeah that's right she'll have uh, basically it will uh, yeah okay um, again we're stepping into spoiler territory so I'll avoid it but yeah she'll have like there will be a tiptoe between uh two serial killers and it gets dicey. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you're already working on the third one that'll come out next year? Yeah, I'm actually like 10,000 words. Like next week I'll reach the final showdown and then I'll start fixing the draft. So I'm, I'm pretty advanced in my first draft hmm. and so what's the big difference between um, doing it yourself and yourself publishing and now with Thomas and Mercer so they're like do they give you like deadlines that you have to keep then well they're they're actually pretty awesome like we agree on the deadlines together so obviously they have a process so if they're set to publish a book at a certain date they'll need it at a certain date but we define this date beforehand so actually I'm the one 
determining the initial deadline, which is pretty similar to self-publishing because when I self-published, I made myself finish a book by a certain deadline because otherwise there would be no paycheck. (laughs) (laughs) So it's pretty much the same. Actually, the pace when working with a traditional publisher in general is a lot less hectic than self-publishers. Self-publishers usually need to publish more books to be able to make a living. Yes, (laughs) especially nowadays. (laughs) Yes, it's it's really hectic. So yeah, we we agree on a certain date and then I aim to meet that date. So far, so good. (laughs) (laughs) And do you set like goals for yourself, like a thousand words a day or? Uh, Well, I used to, it used to be really rigid. 3000 words per day, like that was my goal. These days, I'm trying to be a bit more lenient towards my goals because uh, I started feeling a bit of burnout. Mm. Um, Like I started feeling that writing was becoming much harder for me. So I said, okay, settle down. So my goals now are monthly, not daily, and they're quite reasonable. So right now I'm doing... 25,000 words per month, which for me is like really taking it easy, relatively speaking, and and not working incredible. Like otherwise it'd be like killing myself to finish each book and I'll just, it would end up with me just writing bad stuff. So I wanted to give myself the time to write better. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's, so I have goals, but I'm, I'm trying to be more flexible and lenient towards myself. And do you usually write in the same place? Like uh, you have a place in your home or you go to a coffee shop? Yeah. yeah. No, no, I have a, like, I, I have an office at home and I write on a, it's not a laptop, it's like a desktop computer. So I always write in the same location, same. I have like this ergonomic keyboard because otherwise they get these um, uh, infection, like, um, not infections, uh, what's the word? Oh, yeah, the carpal tunnel uh, pain, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, or in the elbow. In the wrist, and yeah. Yeah, so so I have this ergonomic keyboard, which is really great. Um, and just, uh, just my office, it has a door, so I can close it if the kids get too loud. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, software do you use like Word or? I use Scrivener. Oh yeah, I love Scrivener. Um, it's it's just amazing. Like it was an eye opener when I started writing. I used to write on Office on Word, and it, it, it was it's not a bad like software for writing. But I used to be a programmer, so the whole concept of a book being a series of objects, like the chapters, the scenes, it it connected with me <laughs> so well and I was like this is perfect <laughs> this is what I always needed um, you're like Neo you're looking at things in code <laughs> in the matrix <laughs> I sometimes feel like this is what programming in a way it taught me to write better because programming is all about taking a problem splitting it into smaller problems and splitting them into even smaller problems until you reach a problem which is really simple, which is like something you can write a 10 line function to solve. So in a way, writing is the same. You have like this plot essence, profiler, chases, killer, like serial killer, um, and then you can start breaking it up. Okay, so I want like, there will be three sections of the book. The, the first, the introduction, and then the like the main chase, and then the final showdown, and then break those apart. So it's it's a lot like programming in the end. By the end, you reach the scene, which is the smallest part, and then you can just write that, and you don't have to think about the entire story when you write the scene. Oh yeah, that's a good that's a great way of looking at it. Like like little blocks of things that need to be put in for the whole thing. <laughs> Scrivener really works well with that like type of writing because I have those tiny blocks and I can shift them around later and it's really nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that drag and drop. Like, oh no, this scene goes up here, not down there. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna uh, do you, are you gonna go back to writing the uh, the Glenmore Park series or are you focusing on Zoe right now? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I like the Glenmore Park. I kind of 
always feel like I want to write it again, but um, like I, I literally have no idea. Mm-hmm. Whenever I, people ask me that sometimes, and I and, and I actually have no idea. I actually tried to write Glenmore Park for a while back, and I didn't manage it. I just they have like a I don't know a 15k book start somewhere, and it just didn't work, and I stopped. So I'm not sure. If I'll go back to Glenmore Park, the characters might make like guest appearances in other books. That's one of the options. So we'll see. Oh yeah, that'll be, yeah. I didn't realize that Zoe Bentley was started as a character in your other series. So that'll be that's kind of cool that they cross over. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the her boss, the the, the chief, Christine Mancuso, mm. is like the she's an FBI agent in the Glenmore Park mystery. Promoted to being the chief in the BAU after the third book, in which she plays a major. Oh, okay, well, that's cool. Uh, I didn't, didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay, and so okay, well, and then um, you know, we we have aspiring writers that listen to this podcast. Do you have any advice for them? They're struggling with their first uh, <laughs> their first draft. Or... My advice is well, it's like the most cliche advice that most writers give which is keep writing and keep reading and don't give up I've been like I sometimes people think that my success was an overnight thing I published my first book at the age of 16 and I published The Killer's Mind when I was um, 38 so So it wasn't exactly an overnight thing and uh, and I got a lot of rejections in the way and some more flops and um, like I had to get a lot of experience under my belt to make it work so for those of you who really really want to do it you have to know that you don't need to give up specifically like this is actual specific things you can do is follow Don Winslow on Twitter is just has like these awesome examples of like how he started out and where he is now, which is really encouraging. And I love reading Chuck Wendig's blog. Oh yeah. Just, like it's, it's just like perfect mindset for writers as far as I'm concerned. Like, I never find myself disagreeing with him. So, and uh, and I and he's really funny as well. So yeah. <laughs> so that's an actual like useful advice I can give, and I, I do give it to writers who asks me who ask me what what should they do. Uh, I tell them, well, are you reading Chuck Wendig's blog? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I'll have to go check out Don Winslow's Twitter feed. But yeah, I like Chuck's uh, blog. That's a a lot of good advice on there. Yeah. (laughs) And and like you said, funny. (laughs) Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks, Michael. I want to thank you for for being on the podcast and taking time to talk to us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Meet the Thriller Author podcast. Be sure to visit thrillerauthors.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover great thrilling reads. If you enjoy the podcast, I'd love for you to subscribe, uh, rate, and give a review uh, to it, wherever it is that you're listening to this uh, podcast, be it uh, iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, wherever it is that you're uh, listening to this right now, I would appreciate it. And uh, please do check out my own thriller novels over at my website at alanpeterson.com. Until next time.